Hey guys, Sean Bougie, SurplusFundsRiches.net. This is our free training webinar. The reason we're doing this, I feel obligated to tell you why we are doing this. Otherwise, you're not going to watch the entire video because you're going to think it's clickbait or I'm going to leave something out that's important for you to know. No, this is complete training and I'll tell you why we're actually giving this away for free. First of all, we make our money partnering up with folks to get our program, our members. In a recent week, we teed up a million dollars in surplus deals and 500,000 in flips. Just so you guys know, we keep that going. And because we added more staff, got even better with the tech, we keep that going. We're going to pay out 7.75 million to partners over the next year. Our value obviously is far more than just the education on how to do it on your own. We are betting that folks will partner with us, not just buy a system. We're not doing a hit and run here, guys. We're not gonna sell you a system and go, good luck to you, pat you on the bottom, let you go. 30% um, of our buyers started with someone else first, and over 25% of the partners that work with us, even after they've worked surplus funds on their own, they're still working with us, guys. That tells us, again, that the value of what we provide is not just education, but the partnership. And I'm going to show you exactly how to do this on your own so you'll understand the value of that as well. Our dear friend also and past real estate partner, Troy, recently had a massive heart attack. Um, he was actually doing a film promo for his band, had a massive heart attack. And it just reminded us we have only so many minutes and we want to push the expansion of the company right now. Um, and we want to leave a legacy. Secondly, we're going to go through an overview really quickly here of what's on the training. Again, to remind you, hey, take the time. Pull out a notebook, pull out a pen, take the time to watch this because I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom. Everything you need to succeed is going to be in this video. Um, lastly, uh, we'll go through the entire training again and show you everything we're doing. So let's go through the overview first so you understand all that you're getting in this training. Real quick, guys, visit surplusfundsriches.net when you get an opportunity. Click the products tab, and you can also, once you get to the products, you'll have to sign in with your name and email. That's so that we don't get spammed by competitors. That was happening before. They were hitting our website a thousand times a minute uh, to, to bring it down. So by doing that sign in, that got rid of that. Um, click the products tab, put your info in. You can read the insider's guide at the bottom of the page on the products page. You can also call me. I'll be giving you my personal cell phone. Uh, number during this training. You'll be able to call me between 9 and 9 a.m. and 1 p.m. Eastern Time, Monday through Friday. So here's what you're getting, guys, in this training. Uh, teach you how to get mortgage and tax overage lists, getting them online, whether or not you should buy them, the pros and cons with that, requesting them if you need to from counties if they don't have online lists. It's not hard to do. Also, our one and done method. That's going to be really important. You understand how to do that. Um, and then difficult or different areas to work. That's going to be important. Uh, researching the lists. Guys, once you get a list, you need to research the debt and the ownership of the property at the time of the sale because sometimes the name on the list is not the owner. Also, because if there was additional debt, that debt is entitled to the overage, not the owner. This is designed for you to understand who to, to go after and not waste your time. These other guys I know are telling you that the debt's kicked out at the foreclosure. <coughs> the only debt, <clears throat> excuse me, kicked out on the foreclosure is the foreclosing entity debt. However, the other debt, even though it's no longer against the property, has a priority claim to the overage. So you need to know, was there a second mortgage? Was there a HELOC loan? Was there you know anything like that that could somehow keep you from collecting the funds? Otherwise, you're just going to waste your time. I'm also going to touch on incomplete lists, how to go around uh, or rather figure out lists where you only have a parcel ID number. Um, deceased owners, we'll talk about that, how you don't have to open up probate in a lot of instances and quick claim deeds and the impact those have on your research. Skip tracing, we're going to tell you who to use and why, give you some insider tips with that. Contacting, we're talking about mailings, calls, texts, whether or not you use social media, virtual assistance, any of that and how to incorporate a takeaway close into uh, your contact with these people. 
um, negotiation. We're going to talk about disbelief and mistrust, how some people in the industry have a problem with that. We don't because of the way we do this. So we'll talk about that. Um, the contracts, I'm actually going to get into what the contracts are, the content and the structure of those con uh, contracts and the legality and how this gets us around any finder caps. You can make, uh, I have people that work with me just because they can make more money doing part of the work, partnering up with us than they can make on their own as a standard finder because of the system we put into place. Um, hiring notaries and uh, attorneys, the speed that's involved, why that's important and why it's important to do a title recheck prior to having the attorney. And yes, we always use attorneys and think that if you don't uh, use attorneys in this business, you're wasting time, energy, money, and just not doing it right. So let's continue to go through. All right, guys, so we work both mortgage and tax overages. Um, there's a couple of different ways to get lists. They're not hard. Online, I'm going to give you an example right now of actually how easy it is to find lists and just give you an example. This is real time. I'm recording this the 16th of March, 2022. Um, and I don't know, by the way, how long I'm going to have this up, this free training. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm betting it's going to it's going to result in us continuing to expand. If it doesn't, I'll pull it down. You know, I mean, it's that easy. But so real examples of a search. Okay, so what I plugged in on Google was overbids list. Um, you can also ch uh, check out surplus funds list, mortgage overage list, tax sale overage list, tax deed overage list, excess funds, excess proceeds. There are a number of different names for surplus funds or overages. Overbids is just one of them. I plugged this in to give you guys an example of what's out there. This is a very small county, very small county. And you can see, even on this very small county, we've got a 19,000, 16,000, 13,000, and $8,700 one. Tiny little county for tax overages. This is where it gets interesting. Larger county, we've got both the foreclosure sales surplus, which is the mortgage overages. I'm gonna see if I can get in a little closer. So guys, you can see another small county, some small ones here, 10,000 then, 109,000, 8,300, 27,000, 25, 25, 114, 15, 35, 652,000, 59,000, 77,000. And guys, right now is the time to get into this because the, more, the, the market is so hot that the overages are getting higher and higher and higher by the day. 33,000, 55,000, 124,000, 353,000, I skipped that one, 44, 138, 87, okay? Two million just off of one recent list. So there's, and that's just one county, there are over 3,000 counties in the United States, right? That was mortgage. Again, small county, and that was still what we got. These are tax in that small county. Now we can scroll through amount of surplus. One of the points, 18,000, one of the points I want to make here, guys, as we're scrolling through this, is you saw a lot of folks just work tax overages. These are mortgage overages. And I mean, we, these are tax here, but the previous list I gave you was mortgage overages. And you saw how many high dollar ones there were on that, too. Um, 93,000, okay, 62 minus somebody made a claim on 10 of that, okay, 100, oh, hold on, 41,000, 6,100, 5,300, you can see there's a lot of smaller ones too, but 12,000, oops, 25,000, 8,800, oops, 35, 37, 16. By the way, guys, let me make a quick point here. I love this particular list because, you know, they're updating it, obviously, but look, there was a claim on 6,300. Who made that claim? I know a lot of you guys are out there going, wait a minute, it's all due to the owner. Why would they only 
claim that. Right? Right? Maybe it was one third of them, one of three owners, or maybe it was somebody that was a creditor. You gotta check that. And I'm gonna show you how to do that. It's not hard. 13,000, 10,000, 23,000, 42,000. So that was a real search, guys, online. It was just using one search term on Google. And I only showed you the first couple of results off of that page. So obviously, I mean, there's 3,000 plus counties, guys. It's ridiculous. We do not have a saturation issue in our business. Never have. It's not an issue. Uh, as far as buying lists, there's pros and cons with that. The obvious con is if you can buy it, so can somebody else. We would prefer to teach you how to fish and get your own list. Um, in addition to finding them online and buying them, you can also request them. That can be one of the most productive ways to do it, and I'll touch on that in a second. But if you are going to buy, guys, I recommend uh, taxsaleresults.com. I think the guy does a great job, and those are great lists to use if you're willing to compete with other people. Um, as far as requesting it, guys, whoever held the sale is the person you're going to want to talk to, either in email or phone, whatever. If you need to request it, get in touch with whoever held the, held the sale, if it was a department, if it was the county clerk, whoever hold that, held that particular tax or mortgage foreclosure sale, they're the ones that are going to be able to tell you where the list is. Um, not hard to do. You're literally saying, I'm looking for, and I would list the different terms, overbids, okay, surplus funds, excess proceeds, tax sale overages, mortgage sale overages, whatever you want to ask for. Put that in an email or have a conversation on the phone with them asking for their particular list. A lot of times they'll just email it to you. Sometimes they'll request you send a self-addressed envelope with a check and they can return that money to you uh, or rather that list to you fairly quickly. A lot of times they'll email it. Sometimes they'll, again, use your self-addressed stamped envelope to return that. And remember, and I'm gonna, this is going to come up later. Whenever there's a barrier, whenever there's something you need to do that some people would be afraid to do, um, that's opportunity because other people aren't going to do it. So requesting a list really does pay off. And just so you know, I've said this before, I know I sound like a smart aleck when I say it, but there's no other way to get this across. Guys, it's the court's job to give you the information. If they ask you why you're asking, you tell them the truth, I'm doing research. And the bottom line is, there's not a black helicopter flying over the court waiting for somebody to call them and ask this question so they can come and arrest you. Okay, it's silly, get over your fear, and you'll do, you'll get lists that nobody else is working. All right, so let's talk about the one and done method with that too. So sometimes you'll be calling counties and don't work your, just your area, that's stupid. Work wherever you can get a list online. You do this all online from home. So um, sometimes you'll call and a county will say they don't know what you're talking about and you can't get anywhere with it. They don't have an online list you move to another county, you call maybe three or five counties, all of a sudden one of them gets you a list. The one and done method is once you get that list, you can contact those other counties and go, hey, listen, I, I need to show you what list I was asking about. Can I email this to you? They'll say, sure. You email it in and then they'll go, oh, okay, yeah, we've got that list. We know what we're talking about now. And they'll get it to you. That's the one and done method. Once you get a list from one county in one state, you're golden to get a list for that entire state. So worst areas, I'm gonna say difficult areas, right? We work, if somebody wants to partner up with us, and we'll do all the heavy lifting there, uh, all of it. Anyway, if somebody wants to partner up with us, the worst areas that we found, or the difficult areas, Philadelphia is really difficult. The sheriff got arrested years ago, a previous sheriff for embezzling funds from surplus funds, sending the money offshore. He was asked to resign. I, I don't even think he had to pay the money back, which was millions. But anyway, they started the DART program, Defendant Asset Recovery Team in Philadelphia. Uh, it takes over a year to get money out of that court. They just drag tail. Um, Colorado, Oregon, and Washington State, we do not work just because they're a pain in the butt. D.C., District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., is very difficult to work because they're just dirty. Same thing with Cook, Illinois, Cook County, Chicago, Illinois. Very difficult to work. Arizona is harder to work simply because whenever you do a search, online for some of these uh for online lists uh arizona for certain search terms comes up on the first page and everyone's working especially maricopa county we actually put a list to maricopa county uh, a link to that on our website because we knew it was worthless to try to really work it it's really difficult to put deals together out there so other areas that are a little different or difficult virginia is a commonwealth state so is pennsylvania 
Virginia is a Commonwealth state. So in Virginia, the counties are given a lot more leeway or latitude on how they handle lists, what they call them and all that. So getting a list from one county doesn't necessarily mean the one and done method doesn't work there because you're going to have to explain to the next county how you're, what you're doing. However, there's a hell of a lot of money in Virginia. Excuse my French. California is difficult to work because most counties only hold once a year tax sales. Um, those tax overages, you have to wait a year for your claim to be looked at, even though you can submit it right away. They have to wait for the one year redemption period in California to be up in order to claim surplus. So there's a one year delay built into being able to get the money. One year delay from the date of the sale, actually technically from the date they record that, the, the deed on that. Okay, the other issue with California, same thing with Texas, which is next on the list, is mortgage overage lists are gonna be impossible to get. You can get tax, tax overage lists, no problem. Mortgage overage is gonna be a little more difficult to get because they allow the foreclosing attorney called the trustee for the bank, they allow them to actually do uh, the surplus funds. They give the surplus funds out, I'm sorry, to claimants. So those guys just don't give a list out because it's too much liability. They wait for a certain time period and then send it off to the state. So you can't get mortgage overage lists in California or Texas. And yes, I'm just as surprised as you are that California and Texas have something in common. <laughs> um, well, let's see, New York, we've just had difficulty, our guys have had difficulty getting accurate lists in the past. Um, Georgia, they require that you pay a fee in order to access the Registry of Deeds or Online Land Records Department, which you're gonna need to do to research debt. Now, as a result, people don't pay the $25 a month, which is cheap, guys, just put the law day down for Christ's sake. Um, Georgia's easy to do. You just have to pay that in order to research. The, it gets you uh, access to all counties across the state. Michigan, in the past, they have kept tax sale overages. Mortgage overages, we can work, but Michigan, tax sale overages, in the past, they've kept them, said it was used for community redevelopment. There was a recent court case that overturned that. So we're going to start seeing uh, tax overages coming in from Michigan. Tennessee, uh, the only time you run into an issue in Tennessee is occasionally you're going to see that they're going to ask that you have a Tennessee driver's license to get the list. Not all the counties are tough on that, but some of them are. Number one, mistakes that newbies make. You try to work just your local area. Stop it. It's online from home. There's no difference online. There's maybe one millionth of a second difference in your researching a state across the country from you versus your local state. And maybe your local state's a little more difficult to get a list. So work wherever you get a list. Don't be silly about that. Um, some of you guys on mortgage overages are trying to backward engineer it. You're figuring that everything that is a mortgage foreclosure creates an overage. Um, so you're looking at opening bid versus the sale amount and thinking that's an overage. Nope. A lot of uh, mortgage companies have begun actually opening the bid or setting the opening bid for less money than what's owed just to get the interest because they know it'll bid it up and go over what's owed and they'll be fine and get their money back. So don't assume that an opening bid is the amount that was owed to that bank. Um, and get a list of actual foreclosure overages or tax sale overages. Don't try to backward engineer it. Okay, there are some ways to do that. We're probably coming out with something uh, in the future to show you how to do that in certain states. Um, but right now, I'm telling you, it's usually a waste of time. You also have to check the age of the list and verify that the funds are there because if it's an old list, you're chasing money that may have been claimed either by the individual or another uh, asset recovery person. So researching lists, guys, you have to research the ownership and the debt as it stood the day of the sale. The reason for that is whatever is foreclosing, that debt was taken care of in the foreclosure. But if there was a second mortgage or a HELOC loan, equity line loan, or there was um, a bondsman's deed, bail bondsman's deed, if there was some other debt against the person or the property prior to the sale, that debt has a priority claim to the overage. I know you've been told by people online that you simply have to get the name off the list, call them, make a deal and go make a claim. No, absolutely not. If there was additional debt, that is entitled to the overage, not the person. I know also what you're going to argue with me about. You're going to say that debt was kicked out against the property. It absolutely was. That debt no longer stands against the property. It's still debt. That's why mortgage companies and creditors can get default judgments against people. It's still debt against the person, which means it has a priority claim to the overage. So you have to do research. Okay, so let's do something really quick. I'm going to show you guys 
what that looks like researching debt and ownership it is not hard and i'm going to actually take you through that real quick the reason i'm the the method i'm going to use here is i'm going to show you for instance let's say that you got uh, that it was my name, Sean Bougie, S-H-A-W-N-B-U-I-G-E. Let's say you got that name on a list and you wanted, you, that's all you had. You had the, maybe you had the address, maybe you didn't, but you do have an overage amount. What the heck, where would you go? Where would you start? How do you research ownership and debt? It's not hard. And we'll teach it. We'll take you through that really in depth, step by step in the program. But I'm going to actually show that to you right now. So the first step is to just Google the county. And Me I, what I did with this one was Mecklenburg County Tax Assessor. Okay, guys, one of the things is you can follow behind me in this training or watch it again and, and do it and see it yourself. It's not hard to do. So I'm going to go to the County Assessor's Office. So sometimes you can use the GIS Polaris search. You can also just do a tax bill lookup, which is usually best way to go see if I can get this in frame so I'm just gonna go ahead and search by owner name because I had that on this list let's say that's me you can see where they showed the ownership transfer at one point and then they also show a current bill has a street address right if you didn't have that now you got it has the legal description okay well, and just so you know, L and M usually mean lot and map in North Carolina, but it's fairly easy. This is a shortened legal description. That's going to be important because if I owed more than one property, you'll be able to check the legal description, which never changes uh, on each deed or deed of trust to make sure it's the right one. The other thing you can do with the system, those of you guys that are trying to backward engineer, you've got a list that only has a parcel ID number on it. You can see that they gave that here. So if you had this parcel ID, and you jumped into the search. And this is true of pretty much all counties. And you put that parcel ID in. It's going to pop up. Not only for me when I owned it, but it's also going to show when the last person owned it, when that bill was. Okay, so we've got the ownership transfer. This is, it was in 2020. So we already know we have the shortened um, a legal description we have the date when they when I first bought it and normally at this point you'd see another transfer if you were looking for a property that got foreclosed on you would see another transfer to another individual however I didn't get foreclosed on so that's where we are we can take that information and go to the register of deeds also called the land records department for that particular county okay this is for Mecklenburg County I'm going to click here to acknowledge it, the disclaimer, real estate, I'm going to search the entire index, and I'm going to put in my name. And this is where you're going to see something interesting. So if somebody's owned a property for a long period of time, they may have had multiple deeds of trust or mortgages against the property. There may have been a lot of things going on. This is me, not necessarily that property. And I used to do a lot of work with past clients as a realtor where I took power of attorney and then a pre-deed, for instance, power of attorney in order to foreclose or a deed to foreclose, or not foreclose, I'm sorry, to close on a property either I listed or I sold the buyer for, or they were out of town or they couldn't make it. I, would, I had power of attorney for them. And I did that a lot, okay? But you can see also another way to go through this, besides the fact that I'm not looking for powers of attorney, you can see lot numbers don't match. It was lot 27, map 27. So these do not apply. See how easy that is to, to filter through all this stuff? None of that applies. Now, if I go to the next page, again, you'll see this is regarding something else. You've got acreage, and it was regarding my client on that. So you'd know not even look at that. But what do we have here? So right here we have a deed, and guess what? That name, Tammy Carlson, matches the name of the person who owned the property prior to getting this. So this has got to be the deed on the property. So immediately we know when it's sold to me, okay? Which is important. You need to know, how, you know, when I took took ownership. 
So this is what a deed looks like, guys. General warranty deed. Pretty straightforward. Tells you when it closed, where it's recorded. All of that is very easy to read. Okay. You can also see lot 27 still well placed. We've got a match. They'll also usually have an addendum like this where it says lot 27, map 27, page. That's your legal description. Okay, they usually use an attachment for that. So now we know when I bought it. Now what about debt? Well, that's just as easy. What we see next, or rather same day, is this. Again, we have a deed. This is called a deed of trust. Let me move this a little bit. Call a deed of trust on the property. Okay, which in is the North Carolina, oops, which in North Carolina is what they call a mortgage. And you can see everything you want about it. How much I bought it for, what the terms of the deal are, the fact that it's a security instrument, um, total amount, again, total amount borrowed, you've got property address mentioned, okay, all of that. And you can read it if you want. They're boilerplate, guys. They don't change from one deal to the next. And this one's long It's because it's a mortgage. Um, it will also have... There's a plan unit development writer because I'm in an HOA. But here you go. So this shows you again. They always use legal descriptions so I know I have the right property. Now, if I had gone into foreclosure... You'd, and let's say it was a tax sale and you saw this debt. If it was not satisfied or terminated, and they show you that if it's satisfied or terminated online in their registered deeds department, if it was not satisfied or terminated, then I would know there was additional debt against the property. Do you see how easy this is? Now, if this was the foreclosing entity, obviously this would no longer apply because they've been paid out of the foreclosure. So guys, I just wanted to give you a really good understanding of how easy it is to read through all this information. Okay. Now, again, I talked about how the ownership, the name on the list might not have been the owner at the time of the sale. Whoever the last deed holder was, the last owner with a recorded deed on that property, they are entitled to the surplus. Okay. They're the ones entitled to the surplus unless there's additional debt against the property which is entitled. Now, if it's a $50,000 overage and there's, excuse me, a $20,000 HELOC loan, equity line loan that hasn't been satisfied, well, we can still go after $30,000, right? Because we can, at the time we petition to get the money, we can have them set aside that twenty grand for the HELOC loan payoff or they can get it at the time that we, that we do this and we can go forward. What you guys have been told online is if there's other debt, it was kicked out by the foreclosure, it doesn't count against anything. No, it doesn't count against the house, but it does count against surplus funds. So you have to use, do that research, guys. The name, if they quit claimed it to somebody else, that's important because you need to know that the new owner is entitled to it, not the person that's necessarily on the list you got. Are you starting to understand why the research is important? Um, again, the debt, you guys are making the assumption that the debt goes away or no longer has a claim that's not true. Incomplete list, we kind of touched on that, guys. If you only have a parcel ID number, you can still search the tax assessor's office to find the owner's last name. And, and usually they have historical records in there, you saw that. Um, you can also use it to find the legal description or at least a truncated or shortened or abbreviated version of that that you can use to make sure you're looking at debt that actually applied against the property because a mortgage against 123 Street does not apply on an overage created from East Parabellum Street. Do you follow me? So you've got to know that. That's important. Not hard to do. Again, okay. Deceased owners. This is important because we're an aging population and you guys are going to run into this when you're doing your research. Here's the deal. 
If the deed said joint tenants with rights of survivorship or tenants with rights of survivorship, and there's two people or more on there, if one of those people died before the foreclosure, all of their interest in that deed transferred to the other surviving owner. So you can go just through them as long as you have a copy of the death certificate. Not hard to get, usually through the owner you're talking to, the survivor. Um, the other one is if it says their name, comma, married or comma, husband and wife, it is assumed to be a joint tenant, tenant with rights of survivorship deed, which means that, again, you don't have to open probate. The uh, ownership of the property and therefore the surplus transferred at the time of death to the surviving spouse or surviving person on that deed. As long as it says joint tenants with rights of survivorship, tenants with rights of survivorship, or it says married or um, husband and wife, or husband and husband these days, right? As long as it says one of those things, and the death, the, the person that died, died before the foreclosure, all of their interest transferred to the uh, surviving person at that point, and now they're entitled to all the surplus. This is stuff nobody else is telling you, but it's very important because we're an aging population, and you're gonna run into this a lot. I mean, a lot. Um, quick claim deeds, well, I'm sorry, what if it's owned by a company? Let's do that. You can check the Secretary of State for the state, even if this, the company isn't incorporated in that state, in order to transact or sell and buy property, they had to be a foreign corporation, as they call it, registered in that state. Therefore, they're on the Secretary's, Secretary of State's website that shows the officers you can contact them, make a deal with whoever it is that has the right to sign for this type of thing. And they'll tell you that, and they'll sign to that effect too. Um, and they will, you'll be able to work with businesses as well. Quick claim deeds, all that really means, guys, if somebody quick claimed a property to somebody else, they just moved ownership, it has nothing to do with that. So if that's the case, if the last owner was by quick claim deed, you need to check the owner before that, their debt, to make sure there wasn't additional debt in place, because the debt can be there already. So quick claim deeds should be a little red flag for you where you gotta check the previous owner when you're checking the register deeds department or the land records department to make sure that they didn't have debt against the property that wasn't satisfied. Otherwise, that debt also counts. It's important to know. Bail bondsman's deeds, you're gonna run across these occasionally. You just have to make sure that those have been canceled or you can call and see if they should have canceled them. They will cancel them right away if, unless the person skipped down. All a bail bondsman deed is, is the company, that's the way for them to get collateral in order to pay for bond for the person that, so that they don't skip. Um, Deeds of ownership versus deeds of trust. I hope you've gotten an idea of that. Deeds of trust, also called mortgages. There's a difference, guys. They are completely separate. You can transfer the ownership to the property without doing anything to the debt. And that's important to understand. Um, the number one mistakes you guys are going to make is you think debt doesn't count. Or you think that if you go to a court hearing trying to get the money out for the ex-owner and there was additional debt and that creditor doesn't show up, you think that creditor can still get the money because the creditor simply did not show up. That is not true. You've been told a lie. Let's go to the next. Okay, so skip tracing. Now you've researched the debt and the ownership of the property, right? So now what you need to do is find them. Find these people so you can try to call them, call them, mail them, get in touch with them, and put the deal together. So this is about who to use and why. The top systems, in my opinion, out there are IDI, IDI data, uh, TLO, Microbuilt, and White Pages Premium. Now, TLO has really gotten tight on who they'll accept. Usually, you have to be a private investigator or an attorney these days to get a TLO account. So, unless you're one of those, you're probably not going to be able to get that. IDI data is fantastic. They're really good at finding the claimant, their possible phone number and address. Great to work. That's always our first go-to. Microbilt, M-I-C-R-O-B-I-L-T.com. Uh, call them. They are the beauty with those guys is they're not as good as IDI getting you the claimant information. However, they're fantastic at finding possible relatives or associates. That's a big deal. That's a big deal. Okay. So if you call them, microbuilt.com is where you'll go. M-I-C-R-O-B-I-L-T. There's no U in it. Okay. Call them. The phone number's online. Talk to Randy Mostetler. Tell them that you were referred by Sean Bougie or Greater Good Company and he will waive the $200 startup fee. And they have very reasonable uh, subscription services for that. Uh, White Pages Premium is really good if it's a recent sale, particularly in tax. 
because a lot of times the people aren't out of the property yet and you can do a reverse lookup by their address. I've been amazed with how accurate White Pages Premium, and I never would have said that before, how accurate they are with their reverse lookup by the address. Now, the timing and importance of repulls. So at the foreclosure, usually within a couple of weeks, they're out of the house. Okay. <clears throat> As a result of that, <clears throat> excuse me, you've got a repull skip tracing at a certain point. So it's important that you guys set up to where if you can't get in touch with them, you're going to repull it a little bit later. I'm going to get into that with contacting them. You're going to repull it. You're going to use a rotation schedule and trying to get in touch with these people. Now, why and how do you contact possible relatives and associates? You're going to send the same letter, and I'll touch on the letter here too, letter or postcard, and make say the same thing when you're doing, using a script to get in touch with these people. But you're also going to, especially if you have, you have very lean data on, on the uh, claimant themselves, send out a letter or a postcard to their possible relatives or associates addressed to them. First of all, they might be living with them now. Secondly, that person will call you and say, hey, they're not here, but here's where they are. Um, that's extremely important. Same thing can be done with phone numbers for those guys. Um, the return mail, this is a big deal. If you get return mail, make sure you look at the bottom of that returned mail. Look at it carefully because if there was a forwarding order on there and it expired, it will tell you forwarding, forwarding order expired and then give you the address where that where it used to go. That's a lot of information. That's great information. A lot of people don't know how to do that. Number one mistake you guys make is you use cheap or free systems and uh, you get what you pay for and skip tracing guys. That's important to understand. So contacting folks, this is going to be a big deal. And this is where a lot of people using others, at least this is what I get calls about. They're using a different service and there's being told, hey, I don't, um, they don't believe me. There's mistrust. I don't have any credibility. How the heck do I get past that? And there's a number of reasons for that, guys. Um, and I'm going to touch on all this. So mailing effectively, you need to tell them where the money is. You need to tell them it was, it's uh, court held funds that the money was created from the foreclosure. I usually have my, my crew write in the address so that they understand we know what we're talking about. It's not just some mailing sent to everybody on that. We use postcards primarily. Write in the address, the dollar amount. We tell them where it is. It doesn't matter, and I'll tell you why that doesn't matter later, but trying to do this by going, hey, I know where there's money you're owed, and I'm not telling you where it's at. Click, uh, they're gone, right? That's why you're getting the distrust, distrust and all that, and you don't have any credibility at all with that. So you need to tell them where, what created the money, how much it is, and then information on yourself. You've been doing this for X amount of years, or you're with rightfulownerproject.org, which is a great cheap way to get online credibility, by the way. Um, we run that just because we knew BBB costs so much. We're BBB. We have an A-plus rating, thousands of inquiries, zero complaints. That should tell you something. Um, but it's important that you understand our bio company with that is great or good company. You can, you can certainly look that up. So the type of mailing, I prefer postcards because they have to look at it without throwing it away. I also prefer that uh, my crew actually hand writes the address name and address in there. You always send it to the claimant even if you're actually, or address it to the claimant even if you're actually sending it to one of their possible relatives or associates. The rotation schedule that we set is we hit them really hard the first week, a couple times in the first week, and then it's a two week rotation from then on out up until about three months. At three months, we will repull to see if there's additional information, different phone numbers, or different addresses to send this out to. We do a hell of a lot of mail, excuse me, a heck of a lot of mailings uh, out to folks, um, and that tends to help because there's always an Aunt May that's a that wants to be in everybody's business and they're a gatekeeper, and they will call you and give the people's name and address to call. Um, texting and social media, guys, I'm not finding a lot of success with texting, even though you'd think we would. Um, social media, never had success with that. You always look like a scam approaching them. Virtual assistants, I know there's a guy online that really pushes that and says that's the way to go. I disagree. I think if you're going to scale up, you need to have in-house people working for you on your payroll. Virtual assistants, in, in my opinion, or my experience in the past, primarily those folks are from an area where their particular accent is generally interpreted as a telemarketer. So that's a waste of time. And by the way, I think these guys, one of the guys out there that does, that tries to set you up or set you up with virtual assistance as part of his deal, um, I believe that there's actually a kickback to him for that. So I don't know for sure. I'm just putting that out there. Um, 
So I just don't think, I just don't think it's something that works, guys. Um, Takeaway. So at a certain point, what we do, before, right before we skip trace again, what we will do is the, the uh, if you leave a message, that's going to change. The message is going to be, hey, trying to call you, name your company, been trying to call you, you're not returning our calls. At this point, we're going to see if we can contact, if there was a, excuse me, if there's a creditor or someone else, we're going to double check to see maybe there's a different creditor we can go after that can claim this money instead of you. Appreciate your time. Have a great day. You know, and same thing with the letter. Very similar. Here's the money. Here's how much it is. We've been trying to contact you. You're not returning our call for whatever reason. We understand that. However, we're going to see if maybe there's somebody else we can contact and work with them instead. Guys, that's the takeaway close. That, and I know none of my competitors are pushing that. I'm most of them, most people don't have the guts to use it. Okay. Bottom line is, it will quadruple your return calls using a takeaway clause, both on uh, written and verbal communication. In other words, messages and what you mail to them. It's extremely important you do that. Zig Ziglar said it and he was right. The fear of loss outweighs the desire for gain. So it is extremely important for you to take it away at a certain point in order to get them to, to take uh, action. Um, let's see. Oh, number one mistakes you guys make in this particular section. I'm making good time. Um, rotation, you have to set a rotation. You have to be organized with this. Using a simple Excel sheet would be fine. Um, and definitely guys, don't be afraid to use the takeaway. Look, if you bought a car ever in your life, you know, they used it on you. Oh, you're not interested in it. Even though I've showed you this and this, Hey, Hey, nice to meet you. Have a great day. Thanks for coming in. That's what closes the deal. That's when you go, Whoa, you can't take that away from me. Okay. Big deal. All right, so negotiation, again, I know what you guys run into because you don't use the takeaway clothes and you try to hide where the money is. I know you run into people with in disbelief. They don't trust you. Uh, you don't have online credibility. You're just, you're not, you're, you're not going to put anything together. Well, to get past it, what we do, look, hear me out. This is the way I teach you how to do this. And we will partner with you on this and incur all the costs if you become a member with us. Getting past that dis disbelief and mistrust, let me tell you what I do. I give them 10% of the gross amount held by the court up front within a week or two after they sign my documents. If it's $100,000, they're going to check for ten grand in two weeks. No kidding. Good faith money, non-refundable. They get to keep it. I send that to them. I send the rest of whatever we agree to, usually another 40 to 50%. When we successfully get the money out, I take full responsibility for the cost of the attorney. And by the way, if you're not using an attorney... You are not professional. You are going to lose to people like me. And there's very few that use attorneys like us all the time. You are not going to have credibility with the court and you're going to get hammered. You're going to get hammered by the county. They're going to take their time paying you and they're going to say, oh, by the way, we don't pay for third parties. So I'll tell you what, here's your check made out to the claimant since you have a power attorney for a minute. I know these guys teach you assignments and powers of attorney, which only work in certain states and re that also puts a cap on what you can make dollar and percentage because we do upfront structured buyouts okay so money up front more later and we always use attorneys the money is sent to the attorney so they can use a trust account to cast a check and they have good faith money so we are participating in the retrieval not just uh, being a contingent type person involved with that as a result we are legal in all states legal we also don't fall under any finder caps and we have credibility not only with the claimant who by the way what do they need after a foreclosure money not only do we have that they sign a power of attorney to our attorney they're not going to screw an attorney or try to go around them right and in addition to that they sign our structured buyout agreement so the online credibility guys um, I like BBB, but it's very expensive. We set up rightfulownerproject.org years ago to help you guys get online credibility. You're welcome to join that. You don't have to, but it gives you a lot of online credibility. Starts you as an A rating. I think it's $199 or $197 for life. I think we're about to go up on that. Um, that's just phenomenal. Yes, if you're doing it without us, you're going to probably want to have a website. You can get free websites hosting on a lot of different sites. Um, GoDaddy, you can buy the actual domain name cheap. It's not hard to set all that up, guys. They've gotten that point where it's super easy. Um, 
Now, why you need to stop trying to talk them into it? A lot of you guys that are watching this training tried this in the past with somebody else's training, right? 30% of the guys that come to me started with somebody else and failed. They come to me and now they're excited and they're actually able to work it. Why you need to stop trying to talk them into it is if you talk them into it, you have to continuously talk them into it during the course of the, or the process of the retrieval. It's a pain in the butt. You just don't want to do that. You do the takeaway, you're, you're done. And now they've come back and they're not gonna they're not gonna argue in the future. Plus, they've signed a power of attorney to your attorney instead of to you. So they're not gonna try to go around you. Um, and they've got upfront good faith money, the way we do it. Advanced call techniques, guys, a couple things you need to know. I used to I actually ran a telemarketing company for years after college. <clears throat> a couple of techniques you need to know. First of all, you wanna change the way that you talk to these people when you're using your script. You want to go up at the end of a sentence instead of swallowing your words. You follow me? So what you're going to do is you're going to go up in tone at the end of your sentence and then go on to the next sentence and then go up in tone again. See what I did? You go up in tone. They will not be able to interrupt you. Okay. Because they've been programmed socially to interrupt you when you swallow your words or when you pump. Right? So you go up. Also, you're using a yes voice. You're not talking to them like, Hey, um, so what we're doing is, no, you're going, hey, so what we're doing, and you're assuming they're going to say yes. I know that sounds silly and ridiculous and like Yoda is going to pop on the screen any second here, right? But no, it's absolutely true. Anybody that's done any kind of telemarketing or online sales or, or sales rather over the phone knows what I'm talking about. I also always use the last name first and then I get familiar with the first name. In other words, hello, I'm looking for uh, John Thomas. Is this it? Great. John, what I'm doing. See, I, I use their last name because that's respect from the get-go. And it double checks I got the right John. Uh, then I use the first name as kind of a, I'm getting a little more touchy-feely with them. That's important. Website options. Again, guys, um, rightfulownerproject.org will give you a lot of credibility. It's fairly reasonable. I think we're going to go up to $2.99 if we haven't already. But it's still, that's for a lifetime. Uh, BBB is a great way to go, but they start you at a, at a B rating and it takes forever. I know I've got an A plus rating with zero complaints. Um, our buyout company is greater good company. You can look that up. Um, zero complaints, thousands of inquiries, A plus rating. Um, the takeaway again, when you're negotiating, it's the same thing. I learned this one by, by being a broker while being a broker in North Carolina, selling a heck of a lot of real estate. Um, you saw that from when I scrolled through it, all the powers of attorney I had for all my buyers and sellers over the years. Um, so the takeaway is huge. You just, if they're like, well, I don't want to do it for that or I don't, Hey, I completely understand that. I appreciate you taking the time to talk to me today. I'm going to send you a letter confirming the conversation just to give you my phone number. If you change your mind, give me a ring. I just really appreciate the opportunity to talk to you and, and sir, I, I wish you the best and I hope you have a great day. Have a good day. Bye. Always say bye, otherwise they'll say you hung up on them, right? And it's no issue at that point. They're going to call you back. You know why? In their mind, because you're using a good faith uh, upfront payment, in their mind they're thinking, you know, I could really use that two grand, five grand, 10 grand, whatever it is, I could really use that right about now. And they're gonna start spending that money and the car is gonna break down. And they're gonna realize, you know what? This guy has a vested interest. He has money in it. He's using an attorney. He's on the hook for that. They're gonna call you back. And if somebody else calls him, that's a fly by night guy out of his basement that, you know, is calling. <laughs> anyway, if, if they get a call from somebody else that doesn't use an attorney, that doesn't use a, a good faith payment, they're not going to care so much about the difference on percentages, whatever that particular difference is, because they're going to realize, hey, this guy's actually spending money, time and effort and knows what he's doing. So you just don't run into that with us. Um, what if they're working with somebody else? Guys, I don't poach anybody. If they're working with somebody else, we go, hey, sorry, didn't mean to step on anybody's toes. Appreciate you being honest about that. Um, we can't work with you. If you decide not to work with them in the future, you've got our number. Give us a call. Otherwise, we appreciate the opportunity to talk to you. Have a great day. Well, what about if they start asking questions? You can just go, hey, listen, ask the person you're dealing with that question, right? Well, I'm thinking, I ask them. You sign an agreement with them. Go ask them. We're not going to step anybody's toes. Let me tell you something, guys. That builds a level of credibility you've never seen. Okay, Being upfront and honest and full disclosure pays off. Even if the people are not upfront and honest, they understand what they're dealing with and you're upfront, honest, and you practice full disclosure. Number one mistake you guys are going to make is you lose control. You have doubt in the process. 
you don't you lose control because you're afraid to use the takeaway you go down rabbit holes searching for stuff well maybe this particular debt won't count or maybe this person is is the second cousin or i saw something where this person this john thomas died i wonder if it's the same don't look find the right person if you don't you can always come back to it later do not go down that rabbit hole you're wasting time also always use the takeaway and guys you always do that professionally and cordially you don't go all right fine whatever if you change your mind call me have a great day now you go hey look i appreciate what you're saying i understand it i have no problem with that appreciate the time today have a great day bye i mean you just you take it away guys all right guys let's talk about the actual contracts how you structure them how you stay legal and how this gets you around any finder caps so first of all to structure a tight binding contract with you on the buyout what you're going to do is come up with and you can look this up for free online come up with a structured buyout agreement hey and this is what has to be in there their name their signature notarized okay the amount you're going to give them up front at what point i usually say within 10 business days that way i can get their contract back in the mail i hire a mobile notary and i send the mobile notary you can send it via via uh email send them a fedex label that they then use print out and use to send it back to you overnight that's what i do i don't play around i get it done so when i do it though the structured buyout agreement has to have occurred certain key things in it the amount you're going to pay them up front and when the amount you'll pay on the back end if for some reason there is a difference in what you believe is to be uh retrieved well then what at what point do you say i'm not paying you anymore like for instance if you're going to pay them 2500 and you get five grand out and your attorney costs you 25 you're not going to pay them any more than that uh it'll also if there's more money that to be had the list was incorrect for some reason which happens more or less money what happens at that point how is that split up you cover all of that in your structured buyout agreement the one i have is about three pages long just so you guys understand the buyout makes it so that people are more than happy to sign whatever you put in front of them i do tell the mobile notary make sure you go over it with them and i tell the owner i said listen read it when you get it read it okay uh, i also give them uh, actually my crew gives them my direct cell number uh, and then tells me when the mobile notary is going out and the mobile notary has my uh, direct cell number so they can call me just in case the claimant has any questions I can I can answer those on the phone as well now the other thing that they're, they're doing is an attorney which is a power of attorney to your attorney now to make this easy because I know a lot of you guys are like okay but what if what about if I'm working in Tennessee and then I'm working on in Georgia and then I'm working in North Carolina and South Carolina and then I'm up in Maine how the heck am I gonna do I have to have attorneys in place before I even do this absolutely not the key is to hire an attorney mostly most people that do this do this legal right it's one and done type method you get an attorney local uh, to work and say look I'll work any local deals but what I also need you to do explain the whole process to them it's not hard to explain it to them usually real estate attorneys get it pretty darn quick um, but once you get an attorney it doesn't even have to be local it could be an attorney in another state but they're good to work with and there's no problems tell them hey look I typically pay up to 10%, sometimes a little more, but up to 10%. I pay my attorneys 10% of gross. Um, but I'll pay you, the referring attorney, 3% to find me an attorney or your paralegal to find an attorney somewhere else just to do that. And they usually go, holy cow, that's great. My paralegal, I will make a lot of money. Guys, the average retrieval right now is $40,000. Talking about $1,200 for the attorney just to have their paralegal find another attorney in another state to set you up with. So your power of attorney goes always to the central attorney and they are allowed to hire the local attorney to make the deal work so once you get one attorney done you're done you don't have to hire any other attorneys um what to offer i kind of cover that i i kind of let them talk when we come down down to uh uh brass tax as far as what it's going to cost what they're going to charge me typically they'll tell me either a set fee or a certain amount per hour and i'll agree to that um usually it's it's reasonable all things considered um sometimes they want a percentage i'll cap them out at 10 percent if they want a percentage um staying legal guys it's very important that you actually give at least 10 percent of gross up front to them 
By the way, if you partner with us, we'll do that. You partner with us with the national surplus, all you got to do is research debt and ownership, turn it into us. We'll find them, put the deal together, hire the mobile notary and the attorney. We'll give them 10% of the gross up front and we'll give you, uh, that's the national surplus, 8% of the gross when we successfully get the money out. No brainer. And it takes 15 minutes for you to do the research once you've done a couple of files. The other one th that we have is the Premier 16. We give you 16% of the gross. Gross amount held by the court, guys. It's a lot of money. Um, We'll give you 16% of the gross, but on that one, in addition to researching debt and ownership, you also have to find the people and just have a conversation. You don't negotiate, just have a conversation to make sure they're willing to speak with us. If they are great, pass it on to us. We take it from there. We negotiate the deal, hire the mobile notary and the attorney. We take it to court, get the money out, give the owner, by the way, 10% of the gross up front, our money, good faith money, hire the attorney and roll it on out. Now, some of you guys out there that have been in business before, you're asking me, wow, the 10 days, why did you build in the 10 day, 10 business days, two weeks? And, and how do you protect yourself? Well, during that 10 day period, the attorney that's getting hired to retrieve the money is pulling title as it stood the day of the foreclosure. So he's going to double check the work my researcher sent to me. You, you can also double check your own work and also make sure there weren't any judgments because a lot of times online, you can look up judgments. You can only look up, um, well, there's a few states that are exception, but you can only look up mortgages and, and uh, liens against the property. So it's good that the attorney can double check to make sure there isn't an IRS tax lien, there isn't a credit card judgment, whatever. And that's why I built in the 10 business days or two weeks. I'd rather pay 150 up front and find out that, hey, there is additional debt and I can't work the deal than pay the owner two, five, ten thousand dollars $10,000, you know, 10% of the gross up front there and go, oops, I can't collect the money. So that's why I built in that. That, that time period. There are no finder caps because we are participating in the retrieval. That's a big deal. Okay. In post-sale redemption states, you need to know this, California, you've got to, in California, wait the year. That hurts. Uh, most of the states, you can claim the surplus even if there is a re post-redemption, uh, tax sale post-redemption time period. In other words, the owner is allowed to come back and buy the property back um, after the tax sale foreclosure happened. Um, but even in those states, whenever you claim the surplus, that there's no effect because when you claim the surplus, that eradicates their ability or erases their ability to go after uh, uh, actually redeeming the property. So the number one mistakes you guys make is you're using assignments or powers of attorney. That's stupid because you're using a power of attorney to yourself. Okay, the county in that case, in most cases now, is cutting a check made out to the claimant and sending it to you and going, since you have a power of attorney, you cash it. You can, you're not going to be able to cash a third-party check. Um, assignments are illegal in a lot of states or that makes you a finder which caps you out at a dollar amount, usually very lower percentage. I know the other guys aren't telling you this either. Um, and you're not using good faith money. And that's, that's the key, guys, to get them to sign. At least that's what we found. All right, so I went into how to pay the attorneys, right? As far as finding them, you can actually go to, you can go online to the, the bar for that state, North Carolina bar, whatever state it is, bar association, and they'll send you a referral for somebody to contact. Other types of attorneys that are great is uh, real estate attorneys. Um, you can walk them through the process. It's usually not difficult. Um, you basically just tell them what they have to do. Some states require a motion. Others require that they only fill out paperwork for them because they're an attorney. The county will send the check to the attorney in the claimant's name and the attorney can use their trust account to cash that check. They can take what they're owed, send the rest off to you and you're done. Or some of them prefer they send the portion that's still due to the claimant off to them and the remainder to you after they take their money out. Not hard to do. Um, choosing and finding mobile notaries. Guys, I've been kind of avoiding the mobile notaries uh, that are on these, that are basically hired by these centralized sites. Literally a Google of a mobile notary, that city and state where the people are, will show you usually a ton of returns. Um, typically you can spend anywhere from 75 to $200. I know that I've done deals in the panhandle in Florida where there's like five mobile notaries because it's so population, it, there's no population density there. So it's more expensive. They have to drive, you know, half an hour or whatever. It's 200 bucks, whatever. I'll do that. Um, speed does matter, guys, in getting them to sign. Um, the, mo the beauty with the mobile notary is that they can meet them anywhere at their discretion and at their convenience. 
um, so they don't have to meet at a place, you know, at uh, uh, like a, a restaurant or whatever. Uh, the mobile notary can meet wherever they want. Um, they can, I should say, they can work uh, meet at a restaurant if they don't want the mobile notary going to their home. That's not an issue. Um, so title recheck, guys. The reason you need that again is there's certain things that are going to pop up that might have a claim to that money that are not showing up on online searches. So it's very important to have the attorney double check that. Um, as far as requesting it through an attorney, you need to say, look, I don't need certified title. I need titles uh, searched as it stood the day before the foreclosure. Pretend like we are at the day before the foreclosure. Otherwise, they're going to do title for how it stands now, and that doesn't have any that's for the new owner. That has nothing to do with the owner that's due the money, right? Because it's already been foreclosed on. Number one mistake you guys make, um, you don't give good direction to the notary, right? You don't go into it in detail. I have them get two copies signed of everything and send those originals back to me and then drop a copy off with the owner. I also have them take a picture of driver's license so that that's in the, in the file for the attorney. Um, and again, I, I recheck, have title rechecked prior to sending out the initial good faith money. So guys, if you're serious about this business and you want to work with the best, which I think is us, <laughs> please consider we built our system from the ground up designed to work everywhere and get past any finder cap. We don't have any issues with legality. We never purchased somebody else's program, which cannot be said for these other guys out there. Okay. We, I know that a lot of them bought my program. They've either said so or intonated that they have. Um, Basically, all they're doing is they're reselling information, telling you how to do this. Sometimes they provide good support. Um, they don't partner with you, and they use assignments or powers of attorney, which are questionable methods these days, guys. That's old school, and it just doesn't work. Um, our systems give the option of doing part of the work partnering with us. National Surplus, you just research debt and ownership, send it in. We do the rest. Uh, and it does also teach you how to do it on completely on your own, too. Um, the Premier 16 program, that one uh, pays you 16% gross, but you have to find the people and have a conversation. Double the work, double the pay. That's how we figure. So we're working a lot different, guys. We make our money working with you, with partners out there. So we have a vested interest in making the deal work, and we have a vested interest in making sure that you're successful. It's very important. Um, and that's using our money, our training, our support, you get an initial PDF. Usually the, each program is 50 to 60 pages long. You get that. We recommend you read it twice once you've done reading it twice. At least now you've got kind of, it's a new skill set, right? So now you at least have the lingo down. And you know, if you do use our online support system through Jeff, that's my right hand man, my business partner. If you use that system, you're going to be using the same terminology. We're speaking the same language. Um, he gets back within one business day. Um, which is phenomenal. Nobody else does that fast. We also have live question and answer webinars. You also have a link from that ebook to a resources page that has a number of things on it. The independent contractor agreement is on there. You can sign online that protects us both. What you also have on there is a exceptional video training, additional video training on there. Um, you also have access to our active files list. So you know what files have already been turned on, so, uh, turned in. So as soon as you get a list, the first thing you do is take the names from that list. You search our list to make sure that they're not in there already. And then you, again, we do not, we do not have a saturation issue at all, but it's nice that we're that transparent. We update that list at least three, four times a week. So you know what you're dealing with and you're never going to get, oopsie, we already had that file. Um, we've been working surplus funds guys longer than anybody else over 15 years and work tens of thousands of case, tens of thousands of cases. So if you're ready to work and you want to get the right system, ours is a third of the price of anybody else's. It's 497 as of this date, 497 for national surplus or 497 for premier 16, either one. Um, and you can get them bundled together 597. We're a third of the cost of everybody else because we make our money actually working with you and putting deals together. We don't make our money just on hit and run education. The 497 is enough to cover basically starting you up, providing support, doing the initial mailings on the files you turn in and all that. That's all we're doing is defraying the cost. I appreciate your time and I promised you my phone number. You can call me 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Monday through Friday, Eastern time at 704-791-7000.
704-791-9398. That's 704-791-9398. Also, guys, that number is on the website, surplusfundsriches.net. Go there. You'll see contact information for me, and uh, you can click on products and see what we have. I appreciate you taking the time. Please let me know, um, you know, if you get an opportunity and we do talk, let me know if you have any questions uh, or, or you like this video or whatever. Just so you know though, guys, I'm not gonna partner with you if you haven't bought the program. Uh, I'm just not, that's not fair to the people that pay for that. Um, obviously there's additional training involved that goes a little more in depth, uh, like really difficult title, how to untangle that and a lot of other information on there. Um, but please don't call me and go, hey, I've got a bunch of deals. I want to partner with you. I'm going to go great by the program and get back to me because I need to defray the cost of starting you up. I'm also not your mentor. Um, once you once you buy our program, you have our mentorship uh, via the support, the online email support and our live uh, question and answer webinars. However, uh, I'm not here to answer your questions if you're not a member. OK, I appreciate you taking the time. Have a great day.